From the time they are young, it is every golfer's ultimate destination. I didn't think that it could get better than what I, you know, dreamt of, but it, it really was. The Masters is an event unlike any other. I mean, there's just something about it that is above a golf tournament. Oh, what a shot! Look at it. It is the event that often defines the game's legends. I remember Lloyd Mangrum, uh, one of the great players of all time. He used to say he'd give up every title he had for just one Masters title. Four days in the Georgia Pines that can transform a great player into something much more. There it is, a win for the ages. It's Bobby Jones' tradition. That's Hogan and Sam and Jack and Arnold. Tiger and Phil, all that rolled up into one. Their names are familiar, the legends who have won there. But there was a time when they had yet to prove themselves on golf's greatest stage. How they got there and who they were before they had earned the right to call themselves Masters Champions. The Masters, when they were young. Hello everyone, I'm Bill McAtee. Many of them are among the greatest players in the history of the modern game. And for the next hour here on CBS, we're going to tell their stories, focusing on those players whose common thread in their individual tapestries of legend is that they are Masters champions. The names that have come to define the game when they were young. I think what makes the Masters so special is Bob Jones. He started it. He established what the traditions were. Well, there's an argument that Bobby Jones, a good argument that Bobby Jones is the greatest golfer of all time. There's probably no other human being who had a bigger impact on the game because of the type of person he was. All over the world, people admired him. You know, Women loved him. Men wanted to be him. He's the only person who's ever had two ticker tape parades in New York. He was a hero that I, it would be hard to think of what the equivalent would be today. I don't think we make heroes like that anymore. Bobby Jones was more than the most admired athlete of his day. Many considered him to be the greatest golfer of all time. <laughs> and led the kind of life from which legends are made. As a child, he was frequently ill and couldn't tolerate solid food until he was five. His family moved across the street from East Lake Country Club in Atlanta in an effort to put him in a healthier environment. Bobby took up golf and became a prodigy. He went on to win 13 majors in just eight years, including history's only calendar year Grand Slam. Always maintaining his status as an amateur, he retired from competitive play at the age of 28. If there's such a thing as a renaissance man, Bob Jones was it. He was an extremely well-educated man. He was an extraordinary individual. I know I would say what, what he did at the Grand Slam in 1930, I mean, that's a singular achievement. To be an amateur and beat all the best professionals at the biggest moments, that's just never been done before and hasn't been done since. And nothing epitomizes that better than in 1925 when he played at Worcester in the U.S. Open that he called a penalty on himself, except no one else saw it. The officials ob actually objected and said, no, well, we didn't see it. And uh, Bob said, no, it moved, and he called the penalty. And he ended up losing by, by a stroke. When they praised him for it, he said, you might as well praise a man for not robbing a bank. I think it's very fitting that he's part of the golden era of sport. I mean, you know, you got Dempsey and you got Babe Ruth. I mean, it was a giant's time, and golf was not a big sport, but he was so big, he made golf big. Jones and his friend and partner Clifford Roberts would need all of his popularity and much more to create their masterpiece in Augusta. They set about that task in 1931, two years into the Great Depression. Roberts was so infatuated with Jones that he assumed that everybody was and that that would be simple to start a golf club for Bobby Jones. It was extremely very very difficult to form the nucleus of a club at that time. They struggled mightily. Despite it all, the team of Roberts, Jones and course designer Dr. Alistair McKenzie 
were able to build and open the Augusta National Golf Club by 1933 to draw attention to the club and to bring a new level of competition to the South they created their own tournament they built that golf course for hundred thousand dollars which is kind of hard to believe and on schedule ahead of schedule they approached the the USGA about conducting the US Open at Augusta National well the, the course was brand new it wasn't really even finished they told Roberts and Jones that although the USJ was very interested at some point, it wasn't going to be possible in 1934. And at that point, Roberts decided, well, maybe we should hold our own tournament. It was to be called the Augusta National Invitation Tournament, but people immediately began to refer to it as the Masters, a title Bobby Jones initially felt was a bit pretentious. And Bobby Jones himself came out of a four-year hiatus from competitive play to help launch the event. Bobby Jones trying to come back at the Masters Tournament after a four-year layoff. In the tournament's first year, his presence alone drew major players to the field. And an historic shot from the squire Gene Sarazen in 1935 at the 15th hole helped put the tournament on the map. Sarazen's double eagle was huge. It was the shot heard around the world. But it wasn't enough to secure the future of the tournament or the club. But nothing, not the Great Depression, financial issues, even World War II, would keep the team of Jones and Roberts from realizing their dream. And when the war years came to a close, Augusta National came alive. As the American economy started booming, the club started booming, the tournament started booming, people were interested in golf again, everything was much better. And that's really when the, the modern era of both Augusta National and the, and the Masters begins. When the Second World War ended, prosperity at last returned to the U.S. and then some. In Augusta, Georgia, Clifford Roberts and Bobby Jones had tenaciously kept their young club alive through the Depression and the war. Now they were determined to make its tournament blossom again. After the Masters in 1942, the club shut down for the duration. Jones had the idea of raising cattle on the golf course for the war effort. It didn't turn out very well because they ate all the azaleas. But when the war was over, 1946, uh, Roberts began pulling the club back together again. They looked up, found all the old scoreboards, repainted the signs. It wasn't immediately clear that either the club or the tournament was going to survive the war, but it was really Roberts' determination uh, to pull it back, to bring back the tournament, to bring back the club, and he succeeded. The new era demanded a new generation of sporting heroes. And in golf, three great players were waiting and ready to revive America's love of the game. Sam Snead, Byron Nelson, and Ben Hogan. They were called the American Triumvirate by sports writer Herbert Warren Wynn. Their dramatic style of play and intense rivalry shaped golf's new era. I thought Ben Hogan was the best striker of the three. Uh, I think Sam Snead was the greatest athlete of the three, and Byron Nelson was the greatest gentleman of the three. Byron Nelson and Sam Snead could have played any sport. They were great natural athletes. Ben Hogan was different. He was smaller. He had to build a golf game from the ground up. They were unbelievable, and you know, it's hard to say. They might have been the three best players collectively ever. Would they have beaten Arnold, Jack, and I? Maybe. All three were born in 1912, when golf's first great triumvirate of Harry Varden, John Henry Taylor, and James Braid were beginning to fade. But golf in America was still in its infancy. Sam Snead grew up in the backwoods of rural Virginia, while Ben and Byron were both Texas boys from the hard side of Fort Worth. They were both very poor kids. Ben took to it because he couldn't play anything else. Byron took to it because of Walter Hagen. When Byron was like, uh, you know, 16 years old, he was taken to Dallas to watch the 1927 PGA Championship at Cedarcrest, which Hagen won, and he followed Hagen. Until that moment, Byron wanted to play baseball. Sam was never going to be anything but a golfer. Byron Nelson suffered health issues as a child. Typhoid fever almost killed him at the age of 11. A doctor packed him in ice and told his parents to prepare for the worst. But he recovered, and in 1924, he heard that a boy could make 25 cents a day working as a caddy at nearby Glen Garden Golf Club. Two weeks later, Nelson was joined at Glen Garden by another 12-year-old named Ben Hogan. 
Hogan had also known hardship. The year before joining Nelson as a caddy, Ben's father had taken his own life. And it really did uh, change Hogan's life dramatically. Suddenly, it thrust Ben and his brother Royal, older brother Royal and sister Princess into sort of a Dickensian life on the streets. Ben went to work selling Eamon Carter's Fort Worth paper, newspaper and at the train station and, and sometimes sleeping all night on a bench, all to try to bring in money. You know, I asked you about that one time. He said everybody comes from a broken home. You know, I mean, it's just something you deal with. At that point in Ben's life, he was more concerned about finding something to eat and clothes to wear and a roof over his head. It all, it all added up to his work ethic. He just got to outwork everybody. Hogan's whole life was consumed by a burning desire to be somebody successful. It wouldn't be long before Hogan and Nelson were joined by a third young golfer who had also learned the game as a caddy, a three-sport athlete from Virginia named Sam Sneed. Of the three members of America's Great Triumvirate, it was Ben Hogan who was the first to take a shot at professional golf, turning pro in early 1930. But he struggled with his game for years and several times even contemplated giving it up altogether. As a matter of fact, in 1940, uh, they came to Pinehurst for the North-South. He had 36 bucks in his pocket, and that was the extent of his assets. Uh, and he told Valerie, his wife, if I don't win this tournament, um, I'll go home and get a regular job. Well, he won that week, and then he won the next week, and then he won the third week, and he was on his way. It was Hogan's childhood friend and rival from Fort Worth who would be the first to taste success. Byron Nelson took two tournament wins into the 1937 Masters. In Augusta, he capped a strong four days with an eagle at 13 to give him a two-shot victory and his first Masters title. After winning the Masters, which he described as the greatest moment of his career, uh, he felt like that that was a home, that was the most sacred place in golf because his hero Bobby Jones had created it and he was really off and running after that. There was no green jacket in those days, but the great Bobby Jones himself presented Byron with the winner's medal. And like his idol, Bobby Jones, Nelson left competitive golf early. He won 11 tournaments in a row in 1945 and retired. He was 34 years old. Byron always wanted to be a rancher. As soon as he had enough money to buy his ranch, um, he stopped playing competitive golf. Although Nelson would add a second Masters title in 1942 in an 18-hole playoff against his friend Ben Hogan, he always considered the 1937 Masters his greatest win. Newspaper man O.B. Keeler wrote that Byron played golf like Lord Byron wrote poetry, and the nickname stuck. But despite the win for Lord Byron at the Masters, the biggest gathering of patrons and loudest roars in 37 were for another member of the triumvirate, with a memorable nickname, the Slammer, Sam Snead. Sam Snead was this natural, uh, swinging uh, kind of hillbilly who had a wonderful uh, uh, sense of humor and loved to, to joke around and would talk to the press and would talk to anybody. He was kind of Daniel Boone with a driver, they called him. The winner of 37 was also the turning point for Snead, winning three tournaments in a month. Suddenly, golf had its biggest star since Bobby Jones. Sneed's success, early success, at a, at a time when golf was really arguably at its lowest ebb, was the thing that put golf on the front pages. Suddenly, reporters had a colorful character they could quote. Uh, he was a lot of fun to watch, and so his appearance there in 1937 actually grew the attendance tremendously at the Masters. Sneed won his first major at the PGA Championship in 1942, but would have to wait until after the war and a stint in the Navy to win in Augusta. In the spring of 49, Sneed shot back-to-back -back 67s to capture the Masters by three and claimed the very first green jacket ever presented, fittingly given to him by Clifford Roberts and Bobby Jones. Jones asked that the members wear a green jacket uh, to identify them, to provide insights in the golf course or directions or serve really as sort of gallery officials. And when Sam uh, won in 49, they decided one of the, the nicest things they could do for a winner 
was to provide them a green jacket of Augusta National. Like Sneed, Hogan served in the military during the war years. And like Sneed, Hogan returned from the war ready to win. Following his six tournament victories in 1945, he went on a tear and won 13 times in 46, including the PGA Championship. But he had yet to conquer Augusta. I think the reason he had difficulty breaking through at the Masters was he really uh, wanted it too much. He had such respect for Bobby Jones and Cliff Roberts. If you look at his, the way he played, he almost always played brilliantly the first couple days, but then he would sort of falter at the end. And I think, I think simply put, he, he, it was the tournament he really, really wanted to win the most. In 1949, Time Magazine called Hogan the greatest golfer in the world. The boy from Fort Worth was a superstar. And then, disaster. Driving home across rural Texas, Hogan and his wife Valerie were struck by a bus when it skidded through the fog and smashed into the driver's side of Hogan's car. They didn't expect him to live. Then they didn't expect him to walk again. Then they, then they never expected him to play golf again, and certainly not play golf at the highest levels. But in 16 months, he won the U.S. Open at Marion in 1950. That really encapsulated pretty much his entire life. I think it's the greatest sports comeback in history that he came back to win five more majors. He was at the top of his game in 1951 and took it into the Masters, where he met one of his old friends. On the final day, Hogan trailed Sneed, who was co-leader, by a stroke, but mounted an inspired charge to win the first of his two green jackets. Lines up his shot and pitches within inches of the cup. A beautiful shot, almost pulled out. It looks like Ben has done it again. Hogan wins his first Masters. In those 50s, you had, Sam, you had Ben one in 51, Sam 52, Ben 53, Sam 54. I think they thought it was gonna go on forever. <laughs> we certainly, we in the press hoped it would. And in a way, the triumvirate did last forever especially in the minds of the next great threesome to dominate the game of golf. I enjoyed the challenge of thinking that maybe I could someday play as well as Byron Nelson or Ben Hogan and, and be a golfer of some note. And that was the way I conducted my life. I played my first US Open with Ben Hogan and he said, you're going to be a great player one day, son. You know what that meant to me? The next great American triumvirate was about to take the golf world by storm. When the Masters, when they were young, continues on CBS. In 1965, pop culture in America was in the grips of the British invasion. But the big change in the world of golf came from a different part of the world, South Africa, in the form of a 29-year-old named Gary Player as he became the only international golfer to win the career Grand Slam. I think Gary Player pound for pounds the best player that's ever played the game. Born in 1935 in Johannesburg, Player was the youngest of three. His father spent his life two miles underground in a South African gold mine. Every gold mine had its own golf course. And so he said to me one day, come and play golf. I said, no, Dad, that's a sissy's game, not for me. I'm playing soccer and cricket and track and boxing. And he said, well, just come and try it. And I went out, and the first three holes were very, very easy holes. And I had three pars. And then I got my eights and nines and tens. But by that time, I was hooked. Small in stature, player became a giant of the game, winning nine majors and more than 160 titles worldwide. It was never a case of, I think I'm going to do well, or I hope to do well. He told my parents that he had two desires, to play as well as Ben Hogan and to marry me. In 1958, he finished second at the U.S. Open at Southern Hills. That same year, at the age of 22, Gary Player would drive down Magnolia Lane for the first time. Driving through Augusta, whew, it was a a sight to behold. And then to have the honor of sitting next to Bobby Jones. Uh, I remember saying to him, Mr. Jones, I cannot birdie the third hole here at Augusta. He bent over and he said, Gary, you're not supposed to birdie it. You're supposed to par it. And I never forgot that. 
player missed the cut in 1958, but three years later, he was in a position to become the first non-American to win the green jacket. To do that, however, he would have to dethrone the king. I'm playing against Arnold Palmer, the great American icon. And here's this little runt from South Africa, four shots ahead of him with one round to go. Well, there are 20,000 people there, and there are two people pulling for me, my wife and my dog. Arnold Palmer missed the putt. Gary Player is the new Masters Golf Champion. I feel tearful because watching Gary win there is a dream. The loss at the Masters in 61 to Player was a rare setback for Arnold Palmer, who had already taken the game to a whole new level. In the late 1950s, Palmer emerged with a swashbuckling, go-for-broke style that was tailor-made for the age of television. Palmer and TV brought golf and the Masters into millions of homes. Arnold made the game what it is today. Jones kicked it up a, a huge notch. The American Triumphant came along. They further ratcheted up interest in golf. But it was Arnold that took it into the stratosphere. Arnold Daniel Palmer was born in September 1929 and grew up in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. His father, Deacon, was the head pro and greenskeeper at Latrobe Country Club. It was there as a toddler that Arnold Palmer was introduced to the game he would one day conquer. Even at two years old, he put my hands on the club and he said, now, boy, you remember that and don't you ever change that grip. And that was my grip and that's the same grip I use today. Palmer was already an accomplished player by the age of 17 and his good friend, Bud Warsham, realized that Arnold was something special. Bud Warsham had talked to Jim Weaver, who was the athletic director at Wake Forest, and got me a scholarship to go there with, with him. And we became roommates and spent uh, the next three and a half years traveling together, playing golf together, doing everything together. Palmer's life took an unexpected and tragic turn in 1950, when Warsham was killed in a car accident at the beginning of their senior year. It devastated me. It, it was, uh, he was my best buddy. We were, we were always together. And, and I was at school now alone, and I, it, it was more than I could handle. Palmer dropped out of college and quit the game he would later come to dominate. He joined the Coast Guard and didn't hit a golf ball in competition for three years. In 1953, he returned to the game he loved, and the very next year, he won the U.S. Amateur. He turned pro in the fall, and in the spring of 1955, played in his first Masters. The atmosphere was so inviting and so encouraging to me, it was uh, the thrill of my life. Arnold finished in a tie for 10th that year, but in 1958, Arnold Palmer broke through in Augusta and would start to become an American icon. An eagle at 13 on Sunday put Arnie into the lead. Then on 17, the CBS cameras gave millions of viewers their first glimpse of Arnold Palmer on national TV. It was the dawn of a new era for golf. At this moment, Arnold Palmer looks very much like the man to beat. It's the perfect storm of Arnold being Arnold and television being television and the Masters being the Masters. It brought the game to millions more people uh, like nobody ever had before. Arnold won the Masters in 58, in 60, 62, and in 64. Uh, and he became the king of golf, literally the king of the sports world. Television made him an international star, and the patrons of Augusta were quick to join his devoted army. But every great champion needs a rival to help define that greatness. For the king, it would be a talented young player from the Midwest who hit the ball a mile, and as Bobby Jones famously said, plays a game with which I am not familiar. Like his friend and rival, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus was introduced to golf by his father. The elder Nicholas, Charlie, had played professional football for the Portsmouth Spartans and instilled in his son a love of competition. I was drawn to every sport. Uh, whatever my dad introduced me to and uh, 
I don't know how he did it, but he introduced me in such a way that I wanted to play everything that he introduced me to. The first time he played nine holes, Jack shot a 51. Nicholas was a quick study, and he captured the Ohio Open at the age of 16. Despite finding success on the golf course, Jack continued to play other sports. He showed a particular enthusiasm for football. Had the legendary Ohio State football coach Woody Hayes not intervened, Nicholas's athletic career might have taken a different turn. I didn't, couldn't make up my mind what I wanted to do. Woody said to my dad, he said, he said Charlie, he, says, he, he, he can play football, he, he, can do, he can do well. He says, but you know, he's got a special talent elsewhere. He said, you keep him as far away from my game, from my game as you can. He won the U.S. Amateur in 1959 and would finish second to Arnold Palmer at the U.S. Open in 1960. He added the NCAA championship and a second U.S. Amateur in 1961, all while still a student at Ohio State. Jack and I were actually married and had our first son, Jackie. He was trying to go to school, he was trying to play golf, and he was trying to sell insurance. And by his standards, not doing any of them well. And uh, he just said, uh, if I want to be the best, I need to play with the best. Jack turned pro in 1961 at the age of 21 and quickly became a dominant player on tour. His first three experiences at the Masters, beginning as an amateur, were far from triumphs. When I finished the first two rounds, I'd hit 31 greens in regulation. Pretty good at Augusta. I'd had eight three-putt greens. And I'd missed the cut at 150. And I looked around and Arnold Palmer had hit 19 greens in regulation. And he was leading the golf tournament at 141. You know, I have a feeling that if you want to learn how to play this golf course, you better learn how to putt these greens. At the 1963 Masters, Nicholas shot a second round 66, posting six birdies and 12 pars to take the lead. 50-year-old Sam Snead made a late run, but Jack held him off with a birdie at 16 in the final round to capture his first master. He was just 23 years old, at the time the youngest Masters champion ever. And there is your new Masters champion. Youngest ever, and the white cap is in the air, Jack Nicholas. And I don't think Jack really got the credit he deserved at the start, because we were all Arnie fans. And so Jack came along, and we didn't like it. And once you realized how good Jack was, then you, you loved him too. 1963 was just the start for Nicholas in Augusta. He would win a record six times at the Masters, including his heroic run in 1986 at the age of 46. Yes, sir! The year after Jack Nicklaus won his final Masters, an Englishman named Nick Faldo chalked up his first win at a major. For Faldo, it had been a long and sometimes painful road to the top. He didn't have a lot of friends. He didn't really have, hold a lot of conversations. He was known as brusque in the locker room. It was in the interest of playing better. It was a sacrifice for greatness, basically. I just came out on tour with the intention to play golf and I and I felt that was the way I mean I'm probably wrong very wrong now um, I went out there to play golf not to be an entertainer or anything to, to go and play golf Nick Faldo grew up outside of London the only child of an accountant and an adoring mother who encouraged his love of sport you know I love school and I love sport at school I did it I played everything and then I fell in love with golf. By the time I was 15, that was it. I'd fallen in love with her. I'd made the decision at 15, I wanted to be a pro golfer. So, wow. By the age of 20, Nick Faldo was the European Tour's Rookie of the Year and the youngest player at the time to play in the Ryder Cup matches. He hit a turning point in his career at the 1984 Masters, where he led after 54 holes, but shot a final round 76 on Sunday and tied for 15. And I played well, but I played it with Crenshaw when he won. I thought, that's how you got to play. That's how you got to putt. If you're going to win a major, that's what you need. Nick was a winner. It's just that he wanted to win major championships. And he decided he was going to change his swing. He was already brilliant. He just wanted to be better. The gamble paid off. And Faldo started winning majors. And his improved swing was in top form on the final day of the 1989 Masters. That's a chance. It's Faldo is back in the picture. When Nick stormed back from ninth place 
to win the first of his three green jackets. And I slapped this thing too hard and it went across the green, woof, in the hole. Can you believe it? Nick Can you? It's just so special. You really feel part of, feel part of the, the Masters history, which is quite cool. For his contributions to golf, Queen Elizabeth II knighted the once shy boy from outside of London in November of 2009. Sir Nick Faldo is the only living British golfer to receive a knighthood. But his last Masters win in 1996 would happen on the cusp of the arrival of a new king of the sport. That, when the Masters, when they were young, continues. I guess, hello world, huh? Tiger Woods wasted no time in making his presence felt. Like so many of the greats who came before him, Tiger Woods was introduced to the game by his father. Earl was very much about, hey, I've got a genius here, I've got a prodigy, I'm not going to make it something that's difficult for him or I'm not going to get in the way. When he was just 15, Tiger won the first of three consecutive U.S. Junior Amateur titles. He followed that with three straight U.S. Amateur titles, giving him six national titles in a row. Those two most coveted amateur USGA events, three times each, is unprecedented. He was already a kind of a superstar at 17, 18, 19, and yet he hadn't won a professional event yet. After just two years at Stanford, Tiger turned pro. He was 20 years old. Once Tiger joined the ranks of the professionals on tour, it didn't take him long to win, and win often. He's a young guy, young guys tend to struggle. Uh, it was like, no, you know, he's one of the best in the world right now. The expectations of what he was going to accomplish in the game were placed at a high level, probably more so, maybe similar to what Jack, the expectations that were placed on Jack. Going into 1997, Tiger was already an accomplished professional. But it was at his first major where he would start to rewrite the record books. He came to Augusta National in April of 1997 and left as the new force in the game. After a lackluster first nine, going out in 40, Tiger chipped in for birdie at 12. How good is this? Oh, birdie. And made eagle at 15. Finishing the second nine in 30. He followed with a 66 and a 65 over the next two days. Finishing the tournament with the lowest 72-hole score in Masters history. And a remarkable 12-shot victory. There it is. A win for the ages. He probably played some of the greatest golf I've ever seen at the Masters. It was like he was playing a slightly different game. It transcended the game, I think, in so many ways. This was a, a kid in his early 20s, an African-American kid, winning the Masters by 12. At 21, he became the youngest winner in Masters history, and the Tiger Woods era was underway. By 2014, he had 79 PGA Tour titles and 14 majors, four of those coming at the Masters. He is the only player ever to hold all four professional majors at the same time feat he accomplished by winning the Masters in 2001. It was it was like this this whole new era was starting, a, a sense of something ending and something beginning, and, and it was Tiger. Tiger dominated the tour so quickly and so decisively that many wondered if he would ever face a serious rival. But there was another player on the horizon who had tasted success early as an amateur, and like Tiger, had the game to match expectations. Philip Alfred Mickelson began playing golf as soon as he could walk around his family's home in San Diego, California. I just always loved it. I loved the challenge of it. I loved the gratification of well-struck shot. I also loved the competition. His father, Phil Sr., great skier, uh, was a uh, fighter pilot. His mom played basketball. So it was an athletic family really oriented towards sports, but golf got into his blood. When I was eight, I realized how much I loved the game, and so I went down to the local municipal course, and I got a job picking the range three nights a week and the trash out of the parking lot so I could play and practice. After a brilliant career in the juniors, Mickelson received a scholarship to Arizona State. He quickly became the country's number one amateur, becoming only the second player in history to earn first-team All-American honors all four years. And he became only the fourth player in history 
to win a PGA Tour event as an amateur. He turned pro in 1992, just before his 22nd birthday, winning 22 times over his first 12 years, but never a major. Usually what we majors are the guys who make the fewest mistakes, and Phil just made a lot of mistakes. I'm always going to be aggressive, okay? I'm going to swing aggressive, I'm going to play aggressive, but in the majors, I want to make aggressive swings to conservative lines, and that's the challenge. Phil went to the Masters in 2004, and he was hitting mostly a fade off the tee, and that was costing him about 20 yards, but he was giving up some of that to get it in the fairway. Wonderfully positioned. And found I'm making fewer bogeys. The bogeys that I'm that I'm reducing are making my score better in the end. On the final day of the Masters in 2004, Mickelson knew he had a chance. By less than an inch. He birdied 12, 13, 14, and 16 to pull even with Ernie Els, who was on the putting green preparing for a playoff. Phil needed a birdie at 18 for the win, but his approach landed well past the hole leaving a difficult putt. Is it his time? Yes! The putt gave Mickelson his first green jacket and his first win in a major. You know, Phil needed a major. He's too good a player not to have a major. It was a huge burden to, to relieve by winning at Augusta. I don't think the golfing public realizes how great Phil Mickelson is. Phil Mickelson's won, what, 45, 50 tournaments, five majors in the Tiger Woods era when Tiger was winning all the others. That's pretty impressive if you think about it. I mean, Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods are the two greatest American players in modern time. They've, they've won everything. When we come back, the next great generation at the Masters after this. From the earliest days of the Masters, to win in Augusta is a dream of young golfers who imagined becoming one of the game's greats. For one player who has already won twice, his life has already surpassed the limits of anything he would have dared to dream before stepping on to the lush fairways of Augusta National. To say he's living a dream is probably, is probably untrue. I think he never thought he'd win two masters and, and do the things he's doing in golf and, and being number two player in the world. It amazes me, I think, that Bubba managed to stay under the radar uh, as a young player because he's such an unusual character. He's one of those great eccentrics that, from a broadcaster's standpoint, it's really interesting to watch him play because you never know what you're going to get. Jerry Lester Watson Jr., or Bubba, was born in November of 1978 and grew up in Baghdad, Florida, in a military family father was special forces he was undercover a lot and i was asking him about you know what it was like in the military he goes you know once you get into special forces they want guys who are a little crazy a little creative my son inherited that from me bubba famously never had a teacher or a coach he invented his unique swing in his own backyard six years old i got my first club it was a nine iron so i hit plastic balls around my house learned how to hit shots high low from left to right right to left all these things Bubba, to me, seems to, the club head goes where it wants to go, and you can see from a very early age, he just did what felt right to him, and it doesn't look right to the rest of us, but boy, it'd be hard to argue that it's not right. He started his professional career on what is now the Web.com tour in 2001. And when he started to win, I think he started believing a little bit more in himself. You have to really start believing before you start doing it, and I think he started to do that. In 2006, Bubba earned a promotion to the PGA Tour, but posted no victories until 2010. In June of that year, Watson won the Travelers Championship, dedicating the victory to his father, who was dying of cancer. We were battling for about eight months, roughly, uh, with my dad, my dad's stroke cancer, and I knew that he, he was gonna lose. Um, my dad got to watch that, mom got to watch it. You never know what's gonna happen. Uh, so to win one time is a dream come true. Success in Augusta eluded Bubba until 2012, when he entered the final round just three shots off the lead. A remarkable streak of birdies from holes 13 to 16 put him in a tie with Louis Oosthuizen at 10 under par. On the second playoff hole, Bubba put his drive into the Georgia Pines 
to the right side of the 10th fairway. He then hit one of the most remarkable shots in Masters history. Oh. Did it hook? What a shot. Look at it. Smith hooking on the green and incredible. Ustazen missed his putt for par. Bubba had this for victory. Another Watson is wearing a green jacket at Augusta. I cried right away because I see my mom, I see my friends, I see all the people that have supported me. Uh, thinking about my dad passing. My wife's not there. We adopted a child the week before. It's the best feeling in the world to try to win a tournament like that, of that magnitude, and actually do it, not just a dream, and put it on. It, it felt like the best jacket I've ever put on in my life, um, the best color I've ever seen in my life. I mean, everything about it was, was perfect. Bubba Watson is the first of the new generation of players now dominating the tour to win twice in Augusta. But many expect Rory McIlroy to earn a spot in the champion's locker room and perhaps multiple green jackets. The 26-year-old from Northern Ireland has now won every major except the Masters. Ironically, it was in Augusta in 2011 where he had the chance to win his first major. He took a four-shot lead into the final round on Sunday only to collapse, perhaps under the weight of destiny, with the disastrous second nine. Some expected the loss to crush the young player, but it just seemed to make Roy McElroy stronger and more determined. And I was very worried about him. Uh, I went to the house uh, where he was staying that, that Sunday night. I looked at him and I said, hey, you all right, son? And he said, oh, I. He said, if that's the worst day of my life, I'll be lucky. I remember thinking, wow, what an attitude. What an attitude. And he goes out and wins the next major championship by eight. This is something special. We have a, a group of, of young players, Dustin Johnson, Ricky Fowler, Jordan Spieth, Rory McIlroy, and a host of others. And it's getting harder and harder to win the Masters uh, because these players are so good. The game is in such a great place, and the Masters has never been in a better one either. Only time will tell which of the great young players in the game today will be next to add their name to the list of legends who have won in Augusta. Or if Masters champions like Bubba, Tiger, or Phil can add to their considerable history by winning the green jacket yet again. What we know for sure is that somewhere there is a young golfer all alone who will utter the words, this putt to win the Masters. And that is what makes the Masters and Augusta National ageless and a place where dreams can indeed come true.